Good morning. It is 9-10, Wednesday, August 12th. This is the TDN Writer's Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. Really stinging that I didn't get that vice presidential nomination. Hi, I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. Also the co-host of the Down the Stretch Show on Sirius XM Radio. Hope you tune us in on channel 211 every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And during this show, I am going to have to recant something that I said months ago. Wow, what a tease that is. I'm Alan Carrasso, managing editor of the TDN. I'm happy this morning not to be a fan of A, the Philadelphia Phillies, and B, the Toronto Maple Leafs. Wow, we actually worked hockey in, and it wasn't me. <laughs> Why not? It's just for you, Joe. Magical. TDN Writer's Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Keeneland has just released the catalog for the world-renowned Keeneland September sale. Released it yesterday, 4,272 yearlings will be offered. Keeneland September sale is September 13th through the 25th. Catalog is now online. Book one features 448 yearlings and it will run September 13th and 14th. Each session begins at noon. Then there'll be a dark day, September 15th. Selling resumes September 16th with the first of two book two sessions beginning at 10 a.m. Books three to six will be each be comprised of two sessions, also beginning at 10 a.m. Keelan has also enhanced its bidding processes. You can bid online. You can bid on the phone. They're also going to have additional on-site locations so people can obey social distancing policies, still be able to bid. Uh, they're going to have virtual inspections that are available for buyers and plenty of more content so that no matter where you are in the world, it'll still be like you're in the sales pavilion. So Keelan, September 13th through the 25th. We look forward to it. Always a great couple of weeks and always great couple of weeks for graduates in the future. You know, there's there's always a ton of grade one winners coming out of that sale. So this year should be no different. Lots of exciting first crop sires, second crop sires. Uh, So Keeneland September 13th through the 25th. And then, of course, Keeneland November after that. Great weekend for the three-year-olds. I think we saw the the top two favorites in the Derby. Uh, Tis the Law, obviously, is going to be probably a pretty big favorite, probably the biggest favorite we've seen since Point Given at 9-5. to five. Our collector, I think, is going to be a, a pretty clear second choice. The only other horse I can think of that might take that kind of money is authentic, but I think the uh, bloom was off the rose a little bit with him and the Haskell. So we'll start with Tis the Law. Obviously, an incredible performance. This is... He was one of those horses where, you know, it was very hard to knock anything that he did or, you know, throughout the year because he was winning by open lengths. He was, he's undefeated as a three-year-old, but it just, you know, speed figure wise. And he just, I don't know, he's still looking around a lot. He, he didn't really just, he didn't wow me in terms of like a, a generational performance that changed on Saturday. That was an absolutely dazzling effort and it looked like a winner the whole way. I mean, I feel like he, that's kind of his thing. He just, and he travels so well. He's, he makes his own. He, he makes his own trip. He's he's able to press the pace, uh, not trip dependent. But you know, just a one hundred and nine buyer, clearly a career best for him. And you know, he took he took a step forward to me to where now he's clearly the horse to be in the Derby. I didn't think that was necessarily the case before. I thought it was kind of narrow. I thought there were a lot of horses that were kind of on his tail. But that was I don't know uh, that. To me, I, it's going to be interesting to see if he, can, if he can duplicate that in four weeks. I think he has a better chance, actually, of duplicating it than Art Collector. Um, obviously, I was happy that Art Collector won again. I've, I've taken a uh, nearly insurmountable lead in the contest. I mean, the guys can still catch me, except for John. Um, but Art Collector, I thought, you know, he had to run hard, really, every step of the way. He was pressed by, like, a 99-1 to 1 shot. They went 23-46 and 46 and change. He still ran great. He still turned away everybody. Attachment rate for uh, Al, I thought, ran a really good race to be second. Um, but he really had to sweat that one out, I thought. And, you know, I hope that he runs well in four weeks. We had Tommy Jury on a couple weeks ago. And, you know, you root for the little guys like that in this game. But I thought of the two, I, it seems more replicable for Tiz the Law in four weeks, or now three and a half weeks, than our collector. Toss it over to you guys and, and what you thought, Bill. Well, uh, not much to add to what you said, Joe, because you pretty much summed up the whole weekend very well. Um, I'll go one step further than you did. I think he'll be the uh, small, the biggest favorite since Chiefs Crown in 1985, who was six to five. I think he goes below the nine to five in this race. Uh, I could even see him being below the six to five of Chiefs Crown. He might be looking at an even money shot, which in this day and age, you never get in the Derby anymore because you have 20 horses, horses coming from everywhere, horses that have won various preps. But what he accomplished 
in the Travers was that he went from a really good horse. So everybody pretty much had the same opinion of him. Wow, th this is a good horse. But I don't think anybody was ready to declare him to be the next superstar, the next horse that, you know, maybe somebody would write a book about or that sort of thing. Now, he hasn't accomplished that yet, but you can now see that happening. This was the wow race in his career that was, and no knock on anything that he had done beforehand because he has been so good, but that wow moment really hadn't been there. And I think that's nothing but good news for how he comes into the Derby. I think that, you know, he runs anywhere near as well. He's going to win this race. And then, of course, we can go talk about the Triple Crown and whether it's worthy of the traditional Triple Crown, et cetera. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he was just fantastic this weekend. And good luck beating him at Churchill Downs. Yeah, and, and you know, Tis the Law deserves all the credit that we're giving him uh, on this show and that you're seeing, you know, around the world. And the thing that I had to recant is, you know, months ago we talked about, hey, if somebody wins the Triple Crown, with all the time in between races, should there be an asterisk next to uh, that horse's name? And I said, absolutely, because it's not the same when you have, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks between races, as opposed to the grueling, you know, kind of normal year, triple crown, um, you know, period of time. I have to take that back because tis the law has just exceeded expectations as far as not only the way that he, not only the fact that he's winning these races, but the way that he's winning these races. Um, and, and I actually wrote down, you guys have used the term a couple of times in the first five minutes of the show. Wow. I actually wrote down, wow, wow, wow. Three times on, on the summary, um, for my notes of, of the race, because that was just poetry in motion. That was a secretariat down the, the Belmont type race. Um, and, and Bill, like you said, you know, they're going to write books and movies and songs about this law based on the way that he's run so far. Um, it was just really impressive. And I don't think he, they've even gotten to the bottom of him. He still ran very greenly down the stretch, um, even though he was, you know, uh, much the best. Um, so, you know, I would take the asterisk off of him if there ever did put one on, um, if he if he is successful in winning the quadruple crown now, not even the triple crown, but the quadruple crown. Um, but since the law may be a horse of a generation based on the way that, that he has been running. Um, I had two more wows that, that, that I wanted to talk about. One was Serengeti Empress. Um, who we've run against a few times, you know, with, with some of our, our best fillies. And here's a filly who won the ballerina grade one going seven eighths. She has won grade, grade one races going seven furlongs, a mile and 16th, and a mile and an eighth, which in this day and age is just unheard of. Usually if you have a good route course, you continue to run them going two turns, but they actually cut her back to run seven eighths. And she broke a step bad and still went 21 and three, 43 and three, and 108 and one. Um, and just, you know, absolutely looked like a phenomenal filly that, that she is um, in defeating Bella Fina and the, and the rest of the group. And then my third wow, although this is an order of, of, uh, of impression, you know, it is a law of being the most impressive was the Gamine race. Um, you know, just the fact that, that she won so impressively, beat a good field with Venetian Harbor and, and uh, Mrs. Danvers and a couple of others. But she actually ran almost a full second faster than Serengeti Empress did. So for me, those three races were just really astonishing. And I know that they were all at Saratoga, and we've been, um, you know, talk, we've talked about and, and had people, you know, say that we complain because we're homers and we only talk about East Coast racing. But how could you not talk about at least those three races um, and just how astonishing they were and the performances that those three winners put in? Right. So not much to add, obviously. You know, I thought on top of everything else, his law did it in a tough way. And he does make his own trips. But um, I thought kind of Shivery was a little bit of an X factor just because he was the one that was going to keep Uncle Chuck uh, company up front. And that being said, they went the first quarter relatively fast. The half mile was 48-ish. So from there, Uncle Chuck had no excuses. Um and just like to watch Franco just ride that horse with such confidence and perch him out there three wide the trip. Um, he had Uncle Chuck whenever he wanted him. And, and then he was under a double hammer lock for the last 130 yards. So that was a 109 buyer geared down. So, you know, a 109 plus, let's call it. Um, so, yeah, super. Uh, there's, I, I can't see beating him um, or you, Joe, <laughs> on the first Saturday in September. Um, 
it, you know, it takes something completely unforeseen. I mean, the pace could hot up in, in the Derby, which could leave Tisla a little bit further back unless they want to sit closer to that. Um, but if New York traffic goes in there and Authentic should fuel the pace. So it'll be a little interesting to see what uh, what sort of trip he, he works out in the Derby. Um, as far as Art Collector, I, I think what he's showing you, I'm not an Art Collector fan, but I think what he's shown you in his last three or four of this winning streak is that he doesn't need a lead. He's, he's versatile. He can be on the pace if he needs to. So he made his own luck the other day. Um, but he can be off the pace if, if needed as, as well. So um, I do think he ran reasonably hard the other day. He's got the four weeks to sort of rest up uh, from uh, from Ellis Park. But, um, yeah, I think Tis the Law is clearly the one to beat to, uh, in four weeks. I wonder who's going to play John in the Tis the Law movie for that <laughs> three wow moment. <laughs> you know, it could be Paul Rudd. It could be John Oliver. It could be if I put on a little more weight, it could be Patton Oswalt. I mean, I've been, you know, I've been compared to all of them. <laughs> that reminds me, what happened to the beard? I decided to, to shave it off. I got so much fan feedback saying, could you please show off more of your face that I had to shave it off? I, don't, I guess, Joe, fans aren't telling you to shave because they want to see more of you. No, that's not that's not coming through. Well, no, well, I can actually grow a beard, so I don't know. That's that might <laughs> that be the like key difference. Days. That was like two days. Before. Look, if you're going to pick on me about something, pick on me about the fact that, you know, my my stable is falling apart, you know, in this contest. Um, oh, all right. Bill, Bill we'll did call you. it right. As soon as as soon as you were you were randomly selected to have the first pick, Bill said on the air, well, there goes the contest. There's no sense in the rest of us even picking. And he was he was absolutely a thousand percent correct. Yeah. Only only people uh, sitting prettier than me are the ones who got him at like 20 to one in the future bet last fall. Exactly. After, well, after he lost the Kentucky Jockey Club, that's yep. pretty. That, that, that's pretty sweet right now. Sweet. Um, but yeah, just to, just to piggyback on a couple of things you guys mentioned, Gamine that was really impressive. Uh, a lot of people were questioning the ride on Venetian Harbor. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but she's just uh, she, she's really really good. Like I know there's a little bit of uh, a little taint I would say on her because of the the lidocaine positive at Oaklawn. And it was hard to completely enjoy her her ability because of that. But I mean, she's obviously incredibly talented, and you know, it's it's honestly, I think it's like fairly rare that you see these these sail toppers become so good. I think you know, a lot of times they the, the hype train is way out ahead, and they don't they don't live up to the expectations. I can't. I mean, the only one the only one recently I can remember Mendelssohn, but that was he was a three million dollar weanling. He turned into a pretty good horse. General, I don't think these horses <laughs> these horses really pan out, but she looks like she's going to make that money back and then some. Interesting to see what she does in the Oaks. Uh, Bill touched on this in his week in review, whether or not she's going to be able to stretch out her speed. But and it is a really competitive, really competitive race. It, it figures to be a really, really competitive field in the Oaks. We don't know. Maybe Swiss Skydiver will be going to the Derby. Ken McPeak said he's, he's still keeping that option open yesterday in the TDN. Um, but regardless, it should be a, a pretty tough field. But you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be running to the windows to bet against her, even if it is stretching out to a mile and an eighth. She's just, she's just so talented. And um, I don't know, maybe, maybe the best three-year-old filly we've seen since Rachel Alexandra. I was never a huge songbird fan. Um, so I talent wise, pound for pound, I think she might be the best three-year-old filly since Rachel. Um, what else? Who, we, who else do we have? Serengeti Empress obviously ran another good race uh, for friend of the show, Tom Amos. I um, think this is her, this is her deal. This is her, her, her uh, right hits her right between the eyes. That's seven furlongs. I think, I think she's just too much of a runoff to be a consistent two turn uh, dirt horse. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I mean, you know, it's great to have, it's great to have these, these great one races at Saratoga. I heard that there were some fans trying to like peek into the, to the track after tis the law. I heard there, there's a little, uh, a little bit of cheering. So, you know, we hope everybody was, was being safe there, but you know, that, those are the kind of races that you really, really miss the fans at Saratoga, especially with the New York bread winning. You know, everybody loves Sacatoga. We're going to talk to Jack Knowlton. But uh, that was that was the kind of race, I think, where you really, really missed having, you know, tens of thousands of fans at Saratoga because that place can get pretty damn loud when you see a great performance like that. But, yeah, so this is a little clearly the horse to be in Kentucky. I don't remember the last time we've had such a clear favorite. Um, as far as the uh, – the stables go. I picked up another 150 points with Tisla and with our collector. 
Um, so I'm, I'm pretty far ahead now, but the Derby's worth 300. So it's not, I, I, I could still be caught. Um, Brian and Al could definitely catch me. Bill, I um, need some things to break, right? John is, is in the dumpster. So we've forgotten about him. Um, but yeah, so still, still some intrigue. I believe there's one more, um, prep that has points, the Pegasus this weekend at Monmouth. Um, and then after that, it'll just be the Derby and the Preakness. Uh, but yeah, what's, I mean, what, what's not to look forward to with a, with a tremendous, you know, really blue collar horse, like this law steaming into the Derby That's clearly the horse to be. It's, it's, it's a fun story. And like I said, we're going to talk to Jack later about it. Hey, can I mention two other horses from the weekend? First off, um, Jackie's warrior in the, um, in the Saratoga special was super impressive. Um, just a hulking horse for two year old, um, Steve Asmussen, Casadero didn't run real well, but, um, but Jackie's warrior definitely wanted to keep forward, keep an eye on in and uh, going forward for the rest of the season. Uh, the ride of a lifetime TDN rising star ran well, uh, ahead of a fellow rising star almost in third and a three old Philly kind of under the radar, but may get to the Oaks is, um, Larry best Monday call who uh, won the Audubon Oaks the other day by a poll, uh, set a new track record. And she's from the family of Jazzle, uh, that whole uh, Blush with Pride family better than honor. So uh, nine furlongs is not a stretch for her, uh, you wouldn't think. And she could be under the radar. She got 100 buyer as well. Um, so definitely an intriguing filly. Like I said, these three-year-old fillies, you know, pretty much up and down. It's it's a really, really good class. Um, and it's, it's going to be interesting to see them clash in the yokes. I don't think that that should be, you know, overlooked in the excitement for the Derby is that this could be one of the best Oaks renewals we've seen, you know, in the modern era. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. Multiple graded stakes winning racehorses like Hard Not to Love and Decorated Innovator is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Check out why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtv.com. So the horses have, have given a lot of joy to the West Point partners recently. Saturday, county final who was the sale topper at the facing Tipton horror sale, uh, became their third stakes winner in four weeks, drew off in a stretch at Monmouth Park, won the Tyro by four plus lengths. Um, so already paying dividends there. And uh, this weekend, Decorated Invader will look to extend his win streak to four races in the $500,000 Saratoga Derby, also known as the John Green Memorial Saratoga Derby. Um, so, so, so shout out to everybody at West Point, Decorated Invader, obviously. Really, really impressive. Um, he's going to stretch out a little bit here, but I uh, see no reason why he won't be able to go in an additional route of ground. So good luck to everybody at West Point, and we look forward to seeing him. And congrats on all the success. Keep it going. So this is some news that we have been waiting on for a little while. Apparently it came out just before we came on air, uh, the Churchill Down safety plan for the Kentucky Derby. Um, we were kind of in the dark and it was pretty vague when they announced how they announced they would have fans. Uh, didn't seem like there would be a mask mandate. They were unspecific about how many fans they would allow in. Now the details are out and says attendance will be limited to guests with reserve seats with a maximum of 40% occupancy of reserve seats. I don't know what the math is on that, but they also say um, total attendance will be listed to 23,000 fans which is less, less than 14% of the attendance record. Not sure how they got that percentage, but um, that seems somewhat reasonable. I think one of the key things here is that it says wearing cloth face coverings will be required throughout the entire venue, both indoors and outdoors, when not actively consuming food or beverage. I think that was the big thing, that it didn't seem from the initial announcement that there would be mask mandates, which just would have been absolutely insane. Now, this we we touched on this before. It's going to be hard to police this kind of thing to make sure that everybody's wearing their masks, whether or not they're eating and drinking. 
Um, we joked a little bit on air that this is just going to, before we came on air, that this is going to make people just get even drunker at the Derby. So uh, I don't, I don't think they need any more encouragement, but if anything, this will, this will be that. Um, I still am a little bit wary of having fans at all, especially since they're, you know, all these other sports are going on now with no fans. It just, there hasn't really been a precedent set for this kind of thing. Uh, 23,000 fans, I think, relatively speaking, is enough, is a small enough amount that people will be able to space out. But it just, I think it's going to be very, very tricky if Churchill and the Derby are linked with a COVID spike in Louisville. I mean, we looked at the stats a little bit last week in, in terms of Kentucky COVID cases. Uh, I pulled them up again today. They had 539 cases yesterday, um, which isn't a ton, but it's not none either, especially for a, a smaller state. Uh, Louisville, the Louisville area continues to be um, one of the main, you know, semi hot spots for Kentucky. Uh, they had eight new deaths. They have 803 total. Um, I don't, I don't totally agree with having fans in the stands, but at least they have come out with some more specifics and they've been able to instate a mask mandate, which I think is the most important thing. Uh, this is new information, but just based on what we learned so far, what do you guys think? You know, I'm with you, Joe. If it were up to me, and obviously it's not, I would still say do it without fans. I, I think that, you know, I've said this before, it, it, the safety of, of people and human beings is much more important than a horse race. And the only way to make sure everybody's safe is to not have fans. Uh, bring in owners, that's fine, all that. But having said that, if you are going to have fans, and, and looking at this carefully, I think this is a, is, is a good a plan as you could come up with. And again, we don't know how they came up with the math. You know, where did they come up with 23,000 versus 30,000 or versus 18,000? We don't really know. But uh, on top of that, um, one thing you didn't mention is there's going to be no general admission whatsoever. Among those 23,000, that's going to be people that have purchased seats so, you know, there's not going to be people walking around. I would think and hope that, you know, they'll try to spread people out in the boxes. So maybe box one, three, five, and seven will be occupied and two, four, six, and eight will not. Um, and again, also to the mask thing, when they came out the first time, just like you said, well, 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 you know, we want people to wear masks. No, 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 that's not good enough. But again, when this Thing first uh, surfaced uh, back in June, the, the COVID cases were much different in Kentucky. They are now they've had a spike. So I think this is a pretty logical, good, safe, sound reaction to the situation if you're going to have fans in the stands. And um, I'll table, we can table this discussion for another day, but at some point, we also have to start thinking about are they going to have fans at the Freakness? And what about the Breeders' Cup as well? Maybe this is some template for the Breeders' Cup, of course, which will also take place in Kentucky. Uh, I don't think you'd have 23,000 at the Breeders' Cup, but because it's so much of a smaller facility, but maybe this is a template for having six or 7,000 people at the Breeders' Cup, we'll see. Yeah, I think the industry in itself, you know, for racing, you can't participate in a bubble. I mean, we've, we've seen that they've tried to make it where jockeys can't go back and forth and they're limiting the number of people um, that can be in the paddock and, and the winter circle, obviously. And, and, you know, the tracks are taking the rules very, very seriously because there's a huge price tag to it if they don't. Um, and yet there's still cases that are going on. I mean, just, you know, the other day, Colonial Downs announced they're going to close for at least two days um, because the leading rider, uh, Trevor McCarthy, was positive for, for COVID. So, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to do their best. Again, this is a very slippery slope that none of us have any kind of a game plan or anything to look back upon to figure out what the right answer is. Um, I think they came up with the 23,000 because that's how many requests they got just from Sacatoga stable alone. Um, and, and rightfully so, but I don't know if there is a right answer. I don't know if I can honestly sit down and figure it out based on all the, the protocol and based on all the statistics. Um, the one thing I, I will still say is that up here in the Northeast, um, people are still being relatively compliant. And when they're not, when you hear about like a big party or something like that, that's when there's a spike. Um, so the, I think we're, we're in the center of the storm and we've seen it a lot more than some of these outlying states. And I just don't think that, you know, even to this day, some of the other outlying areas are taking it as seriously as we are. So I think there's, you know, key, uh, trickle downs, excuse me, is going to get a lot of pushback on this because, you know, fans are going to want to come and they're going to want to, you know, be there and they're going to say, I've been there 21 years in a row. How come I can't go for 22 and it's not that bad? And, and, and all the usual, you know, arguments that, that, that uh, entitled people have. Um, but for the, for the most part, I think that, that Churchill is doing the best they can. I think Keeneland is doing the best they can with their 
sales protocols um, and things that they've announced. It's just a really hard thing to handicap. And that's, you know, people's health and more importantly, how people are going to react to some of these uh, rules and regulations that are input, uh, inputted for their own safety. Yeah, I'm with you guys. So, you know, why, why run the risk of anything happening or any sort of spike or uptick? It just, you know, I've always um, maintained this is a short term inconvenience in favor of long term prosperity. So, why can't we just bite the bullet this one time? And, you know, other places have, have had their big races run in front of no crowds. Um, I understand this is a giant money maker for Churchill and things like that, but it just doesn't seem to make sense. So I do wonder what percentage of the people are just going to um, object and just give up their tickets or whatever, because they just don't want to be saddled with the mask for 10 hour race day. Um, you know, it's just, it's a bad situation. It's, it's, it's been terrible from the start, but you do what you have to do. And, and, you know, just in the spirit of, of health and, and welfare, you would, you know, just pray that nothing, nothing happens in terms of the spikes or, or uh, increased number of cases. And here's hoping. Yeah. I mean, I think overall in this country, there's kind of a, there's kind of a push to get back to normal. You look what's going on with the discussion in terms of opening schools. Um, it's just, and that doesn't seem like, you know, something that really has, has any real guidance. I will give Churchill credit here. There's a couple other things in this release I wanted to mention. Um, as each person entering Churchill will be screened via a medical questionnaire and a, and a contactless thermometer. And uh, if you have a temperature of 100 or greater, you won't be let in. Um, it says each guest will also receive a courtesy healthy at the track bag which includes a disposable mask, hand sanitizer, and a little stylus for non-contact self-service wagering. I think they're going to encourage people not to use paramutual tellers because that seems like a disaster waiting to happen. Um, but it says paramutual tellers will be properly spaced and provided PPE for betting transactions. So I think overall, if you are going to have fans, if you're dedicated to having fans, I think these are reasonable precautions to take. I, I do want to tip my hat to them because it didn't seem like they were going to be this strict or have these many um, rules in place when they first announced. So I'll give them credit for that. But I think we're kind of all in agreement that this is, this is playing with fire a little bit. And I just, I agree with Al that I, if we could just bite the bullet for this one year, I don't think that that's the worst thing in the world, especially since you're already talking about having 14% capacity. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how much difference that that's going to make to, to the bottom line. I guess it's enough to try this, but I don't know if it, if it were my racetrack, I, I would just kind of let it go this year because people are still going to wager a ton of money on the Derby and the Derby card. I mean, it's still, I think is going to be a moneymaker, but um, you know, if you're going to go with, if you're going to go for it, these are the kind of things, these, these kind of protocols the, that I listed are the way to go. So, I mean, we wish them best of luck. I think it's, it's, a, a little risky, a little unnecessarily risky, but uh, you know, at least at least it's more specific now, and at least people will know what's what's expected of them. But I think it will be interesting to see what the demand is like to get into the derby because I just I don't think it's going to be like the normal year. But uh, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Fingers crossed. There was a little bit of news yesterday on the three-year-old front. Uh, Max Player, who was third in the Belmont and also third in the Travers currently sits ninth on the Kentucky Derby leaderboard, so pretty much assured a spot in the starting gate for the Derby. has been transferred by George Hall and Sport BLX Thoroughbreds from Linda Rice to uh, Steve Asmussen. Um, the reasoning supposedly was that they wanted, you know, a, a trainer who was based at Churchill for the lead-up to the Derby. Seems a little crappy because Linda Rice has had this horse the whole time, and she has never had a Derby starter before. This would have been her first Derby starter uh, to do this, you know, less than four weeks before the Derby seems a little, I don't know, a little uncouth to me, but I know John has some feelings about it. And I have to talk about this horse um, and the situation because I also, as an owner, have taken horses away from trainers and we've actually taken horses away from Linda um, in, in the past. But I really don't think this is a situation where, you know, it, it was, was Linda Rice doing a good job with the horse or not? Um, argument can be made that, the, that Linda was doing a good job with the horse. The horse improved his buyer numbers, every single race uh, from a 68 all the way up to 
um, you know, somewhere close to uh, to the high 90s for the uh, run happy Travers. I think this was a more of a situation where um, the owner, George Hall, is trying to launch a business sport BLX. And this is his one chance to get into the, uh, the Kentucky Derby um, and really try to get his business to the next level. So I really feel like the optics of it has less to do with whether or not Linda Rice was doing a good job, but more to do with he's got this multi-million dollar platform that he's trying to, uh, to launch and to succeed. And the only way that he's going to get this horse, who's probably going to be 20 or 30 to one in the race, um, any kind of notoriety whatsoever is to announce that the horse is being moved and the horse is being moved to Steve Asmussen's barn. Um, and, and otherwise, we wouldn't even be talking about Max Player and the fact that he lost by seven and a half lengths to Tisla Law and probably is going to be, you know, and also ran in the Kentucky Derby. So we'll go from one Max to another Max, Max from security. There was some news on his front as well. We, we questioned this last week, what's going on with the, the purse for the Saudi Cup. They announced earlier this week that they're going to pay out everything except to maximum security. And Bill had an op-ed about this yesterday about why uh, and there's no reason, there's no particular reason why they shouldn't get paid. So I'll toss it over to Bill. I know maximum security is a horse right now. Everybody loves to hate Jason service for obvious reasons and justified reasons. Nobody is rooting for him right now, but this just isn't right. The horse won the race. Okay. When you win a race, how can you disqualify a horse or for what grounds? Well, if you're dealing with the fact that maybe something nefarious was going on, you have to prove it. The only way to prove it is a drug test. He was tested before the race. He was tested after the race. Looked like the tests were extensive. Now, did he come back positive? Well, the Jockey Club of Saudi Arabia has never said so, but they haven't said anything about this. Five and a half months after the race, they obviously know the results of the drug test. And if he was, if the drug test came back bad or he tested positive for SGF 1000 or anything else under the sun, they would have said something by now and they would have disqualified the horse. So I think it's fair to assume that he did not test positive for any drugs in the Saudi Cup. Does that mean he was running clean? You don't know because drug testing is obviously not perfect. But if you can't prove it, and it appears that they can't, what is their justification for not paying these people? And they put out in the release that they want to see how the case against Jason Service goes. And they said that we're not privy to the information, what's going on with the federal government, the FBI. Well, again, what does that case against Jason Service have to do with the Saudi Cup? Absolutely nothing. Jason Service was a bad apple and, and juicing horses. Well, you know, that's terrible. But again, the only thing that is relevant is was that horse racing on performance enhancing drugs in the Saudi Cup or not? If he was, you got to prove it. If you can't prove it, you got to pay him. Uh, end of story. And, you know, it looks like this thing's going to drag on forever. And, uh, you know, the, the, the owners that own this horse have, have a right to be upset about it. Yeah, Bill, the only thing I'll disagree with you on is that when you when you run in Kentucky, you understand the rules of the game. As, as per the Kentucky Racing Association. Same thing with, you know, New York, New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, pick, pick the, the state that you want to run in. With Saudi Arabia, they are an absolute monarchy, which basically means that you have no rights. So even though you're going there and you're bringing your horse there to perform and to, to entertain and to be a part of the spectacle there, um, they have the only and final say. They are the judge, jury, and executioner. And if they don't want to pay money because there's an investigation or because there's a pending drug test or there's not a pending drug test or because they didn't like the tie that Jason Service wore that day, they have the right to do that, unfortunately. And when you run a horse there, you have to understand that that's, those are the rules of the game. That's why you're getting paid if you get paid. That's why you're getting paid such an obscene amount of money because they are paying you an obscene amount of money to, to showcase your horse there. So even though I don't think it's right that they're not paying the horse for, for performance, um, they have the right to do it. And if they want to drag it on for as long as they want, then so be it. Then shame on the next person who wants to run a horse there and expects to get paid, um, you know, for performing. John, I mean, I don't disagree with you, but it doesn't make it right. And first of all, nobody, when the West and Coolmore entered the horse in the race in Jason Service, Nobody was thinking at the time, oh, if our trainer gets uh, nailed by the FBI, what's going to happen? It's not a scenario that anybody even thinks about. But right now, in, unless I'm wrong, unless they do have a positive drug test, and it certainly doesn't look like they do, they would, they would be disqualifying this horse 
because he embarrassed the race. That's exactly because right. They pull on this grand race, 20 million. And then all anyone was talking about was this horse juiced in the big Saudi Arabian race. Now, you're right. It's not it's not the United States. They play by different rules. They play by their own rules. We all understand that. It doesn't make it right. And, you know, if they want to be an international race, we get international U.S. horses. Well, then I think they should adhere to what are the common practices of rules and regulations throughout the world. In, in any other jurisdiction in the world that I can think of, you know, Europe, Japan, uh, the United States, Australia, this thing never would have got off the ground. You know, OK, the horse won the race. Jason Service is indicted. Well, what does that have to do with our race? Nothing. Here's your money. So, I mean, you know, again, I think that would be really you know, put, put a, a real blight on the race. I mean, the, the race is blighted as it is, but I think they would take a problem and only make it worse if they just said, hey, you know, we're mad at you guys. You, you came in here and you embarrassed us. You're not getting any stinking money. That's also, not- also, they knew you know, the Saudis aren't idiots. They knew the whispers around Jason Service and maximum security. Like, yeah, they weren't expecting these bombshell FBI indictments, but the idea that they had no idea that there was potentially some kind of swirl of, of, of drugs or, you know, you know, negative uh, headlines around Jason's service. Like that's to me, that's that's not credible. Like they knew they knew the kind of guy that he was rumored to be in the industry and they invited him there anyway. So, yeah, now it's just now they're just trying to cover their ass and, and, and you know, make up for some embarrassment. You know, I like Bill said, like no one's a, no, no one's a, a, a bigger Gary West fan than me. But uh, I, I think I think in this case he should he should he should get paid like unless the horse failed a drug test I totally agree he he should get paid but unfortunately they are embarrassed as you guys mentioned and and that's going to be their reason to take their ball and go home and shame on the next person who who brings a horse over there and expects anything different because they don't have to play by anybody else's rules if they don't want to um, but that's also why that race is never going to be a Grade One race because it's not going to be sanctioned under uh, under everyone else's rules. So, you know, you just have to understand that those are the rules of the game. And Bill, I agree with you a thousand percent. Nobody expected the horse to, you know, to, to come up positive or for the FBI to come in and, and do all the things that they're doing and therefore have the, the Saudi family and government not give the money. Um, but it is a risk nonetheless. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. I wanted to bring up the, the ride on the Venetian Harbor in the, in the test. And there was some uproar on, uh, on social media and one of her owners was extremely outspoken about the ride and, and espoused some other things that I don't necessarily agree with. But I think the ride um, that Rosario put on her is, is worthy of discussion and, and questioning. The first quarter of that race was 22.70. And you thought going in that the only way that they could possibly win the race, whatever slim chance they had, would be to send Venetian Harbor from out there, make the lead and make a mean chase her. And instead, Rosario took a hold, stopped her, and, and that allowed Gamine to fill her lungs, and you saw what happened in the stretch. So if the instructions were to send her, and Rosario said, well, I'm just going to ride her the way I want it, you know, how, how is that right? And shouldn't there be some sort of recourse for the owners who, who didn't get the ride they want? It's, it's their asset. Um, a great one win is invaluable. So they're entitled to get the ride that, that they prefer and discuss. And for a jockey to go off script just seems wrong to me. I'm not an owner. And John, I'd like you to to kind of um, pick this ball up and, and go with it, and and talk about your experiences or what you expect from from a jockey when you discuss race strategy. Alan, I, that's a good question. I think that it comes down to two different things. 
Um, when you're talking about regular run of the mill races, you know, a, a $16,000 claiming race or, or even, uh, you know, an allowance race, um, you're pretty much given the rider instructions kind of in the paddock, um, literally on the run. You know, you're, you're going to, you're going to tell them one or two things, you know, either stalk the lead, um, warm the horse up good, uh, you know, make sure the horse is clear, wh whatever, whatever it is, but anything more than one or two items, it's going to go in one ear and out the other, because they're already getting like that at that point. When you're talking about a, a grade one, like the test, um, you've had literally, you've known for a couple of weeks, you know, what your pairing is going to be, who's going to ride the horse, for example, hopefully the horse, hopefully the jockey has ridden the horse previously and kind of knows some of the regular um, fundamentals of the running style of the horse and the physical, you know, presence of the horse. Um, that being said, when you hire a rider who is an independent contractor, when you hire a rider for the race um, of the caliber of uh, Johnny Velasquez or Joel Rosario or Saez or, or the Ortiz brothers or somebody of that caliber, you are entrusting to them that they are going to have to read the race the way that it's being played out. I don't know, none of us know what the instructions were in the paddock um, or pre-paddock, you know, as far as how you're going to beat a Philly like Gamin. Watching the race, I'm not sure even if Joel was told you need to pin her, pin Gamine to the rail and keep on her until, you know, the top of the stretch and then move forward. I don't know if that was a realistic strategy because Gamine is so much better than that group, as she showed in the race, you know, with a 108 buyer, that I think unless you tied her to the eighth pole, you weren't going to pass her at that point. Um, but you have to give these jockeys that are of that level, at that caliber, a little bit of flexibility as far as reading the race the way that it, that it plays out because it never plays out exactly the way that it does on paper and you guys are all handicappers and you appreciate that that you can look at a race and say oh there's five speed horses in the race so i'm going to pick the closer because everyone's going to get chopped up in the beginning of the race and then all of a sudden one horse you know ends up breaking on top and, and steals and goes wire to wire um, sometimes you have to give them the flexibility to make those decisions i would be upset with the way that joel rode my, if that was my horse, I would be upset with the way that, that he rode it. But you have to understand that he's at the top of the game. And if he saw a race playing out differently than the way you talked about it, you have to kind of give him that flexibility to make it a, a, an on-site decision. Um, and I'm not just saying that because Joel won a grade one for us. I'm saying that you have to kind of entrust that if you're hiring these guys to ride your asset, that they have to make a judgment call sometimes. And sometimes it's going to work. And sometimes it's not, but I think no matter what, whether those were the instructions and he, you know, followed them to the letter or he got instructions and said, forget about it. I'm doing what I need to do because I'm going to try to beat Gamine a different way. It wouldn't have mattered that day because Gamine was just so much better. Yeah, John, I think you make some very good points there. And it would be like if you hire a painter, say, paint my living room blue and they paint it gray. Well, wait a minute. I, I told you to paint it uh Blue. Uh, Alan, they, the, the only recourse they have is to fire the jockey, uh, you know, and to, to not use Rosario in, in the future here. But I think one thing that's being overlooked is that what would have happened if he burst out of the gate, asked Venetian Harbor for everything she had, Gamine, another speedball horse, goes with her, and they go 21 flat, 43 and one, and both of them wind up exhausted in the stretch. And I, I mean, I don't think Gamine would have been beaten by Man of War in that race. But, you know, create a scenario where both horses are just exhausted. Maybe uh, Venetian Harbor runs way up the track, doesn't even run second. And maybe even Gamine gets beat. People would have been second guessing him uh, for that. So should you ride to instructions? Yes. But I don't think it was the world's worst ride, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think, I, think, I think there are two things that need to be said here. One, Venetian Harbor was not beating Gamine on that day in any universe She's, she's just not as good of a horse as could be in any distance, whatever it is. But at the same, and, and you know, the owner that, that Al is referring to has, has been extremely online about this over the weekend and has been tweeting up a storm and has veered into a little bit of conspiracy theories about, you know, Rosario and Baffert. And it's like, it's, to me, that's, that's where you lose me when you think that this is some like grand conspiracy uh, against you. But I will say that, you know, if the instructions were to go to the front and he didn't go to the front, like you have, you have a major grievance there. And I think it kind of, it, I don't, I don't know, it's like, you can extrapolate it to a lot of riding and a lot of jockeys tactics in America. I think I get sick of it sometimes, especially turf racing, especially turf racing in New York, 
I've said this before, but there are just, there are so many races where, you know, a quarter mile, half mile into the race, like the, the result is basically a foregone conclusion. And I don't think that's good for the betters. I don't think that's good for the fans. And I don't think that's good for the owners either. I think there's a lot of riding for second place a lot of times in these races. And it seemed like that's what Rosario did. It seemed like he was riding to, to run second because like you guys said, if he does go to the front and try to fry Gamine, maybe he gets her beat, but I don't think Venetian Harper is second in that case. If she's, if she's on the pace that Bill mentioned. Um, so it seemed to me like a little bit like he, he rode the race for a second. And if those, I don't think those were the instructions and they have a legitimate gripe about that. I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think that some jockeys just, they, once they're on the horse, it's autonomous for them. Like they can do whatever they want. You can't say anything to them once they get on the horse. And I think that some jockeys, especially top level jockeys think sometimes that they know better than the connections because they're the ones actually at the reins. Um, but I just, I think that there is a legitimate beef to be made with non-aggressive riding in this country. And I think overall there needs to be more aggression. I think there are certain guys who have really stuck around at major tracks. I think of a guy like Kendrick Carmouche, always aggressive, pretty much always puts his horse on the lead if they have speed. And I think he's stuck around in New York because of that, because aggressive riding is rewarded. Luis Saez is another guy that I, that reminds me of, of, of someone who is successful in part because he's aggressive and because he's not afraid to use the horse's speed. So while I think in this instance, there was no conspiracy and it's kind of irresponsible to suggest that there is, I think that there is a point to be made about jockeys kind of taking it upon themselves to ride races for second and ride unaggressively, even when the instructions are to the contrary. John, go ahead. No, I was just going to add, you know, with, with this filly, obviously she's a Munnings and she has speed, you know, the, the rider in the fantasy, when, it, when, when, uh, when Flavian was, was, was riding in the fantasy, rushed her to the front and she faded and finished second. And then Joel wrote her in the Ashland, rushed her to the front and she finished second. So for Rosario, again, I can't get into his brain, but I'm sure he said, okay, I don't want to make that mistake again of rushing to the front and trying to, to get out in front and, and then fade again. My only chance is to try to pin Gamine to the rail and go from there. He, he made a decision. Now, he's probably never going to ride the horse again. Okay, that, that's, that's the negative is that he made a decision and it didn't work and he's not going to ride for him again. You know what? I'm not going to lose sleep over whether or not Rosario's going to get mounts from, you know, from, from various trainers in the country and top mounts again. You have to entrust that he's making the right decision. I think optically why it looked bad was when you watch the head on, it looked like he had a chance to get in front of Gamin or at least go, you know, bridle to bridle with, with her. And instead he kind of held back a little bit. And, and I can see where people who aren't as used to watching a bunch of races or if you're emotionally involved as the owner, you would say, oh, he's holding her back. But in reality, I think what he was doing, he was trying to check and pin the favorite to the rail to make her uncomfortable. And it just didn't work because Gamine was just so much better that day. Um, so I, I think he was kind of damned if he did, damned if he didn't. Um, but the reason why this is even making news and why we're even talking about it more is because of the conspiracy theory, which I think is ridiculous. There are so many other things in the industry you can talk about um, that are wrong. But in this case, I think it was just an owner being emotional. And I understand why, because they have a really, really nice filly. And she's been, you know, the favorite or the second choice in, you know, a couple of grade twos and a grade three and, and now two grade ones. And they haven't come away with, you know, with, with the flowers um, and the trophy for any of those races it's because they're running against really, really hard fillies. That's what happens when you run in grade ones, um, you know, this time of year. And Joe, you mentioned it before, the three-year-old filly group is very deep. So in years past, Nishan Harbor may have won some of these races, but not against Swiss Skydiver or uh, Gameen or, you know, horses of that caliber. I just think in general, um, it, it, when jockeys are, are strangling horses and taking horses back, um, I think a lot, in a lot of cases unnecessarily, I think it lends itself to people going with conspiracy theories. And I think that the owner got a lot of reaction, some positive, some negative, um, that, but I think that there's a lot of people, if you go on racing Twitter, I mean, there's, there's conspiracy theories about the Ortiz brothers that they fix races. Like, I don't think that at all. I just think that when jockeys are overly cautious and strangle their horses back, even when they have speed, I think that, you know, you open yourself up to criticism that you're fixing races. I don't, I don't subscribe to that theory, but 
I think if, if jockeys just rode their horses more aggressively, this kind of stuff wouldn't be out there. And I, I do think it's, it's a bit of a problem. And, you know, because of that autonomy that jockeys have once they're on the horses, we can't get into their heads. Nobody can get into their heads, really. We just, we're, we're left to go on what it looks like. And a lot of times it doesn't look good. I got to be honest. I just want to, uh, thanks for uh, indulging in the discussion. Um, I just want to make a couple things clear. I didn't think Venetian Harbor was beating Gamin under any circumstances. So I, I don't want anybody to think this is coming from a sour grapes standpoint. I bet a Venetian Harbor tis the law double just in the spirit of full disclosure. Um, but watching the race, I didn't think at any point Venetian Harbor was going to be a winner. I did think that the best chance of giving her her best chance of winning the race was to ride her for a bit more speed. Um, I'm not saying blaze 21 and two and 43 and four. I'm saying 22, 22 and one, 44 and four, 45. Make a mean go a little bit quicker. And then maybe she has a little bit less for that finish. I, she still wins the race, but maybe she wins it by three. Uh, instead of seven or something like that. And to those who, who better, at least you're left with the feeling that she was ridden to best effect to give her the best chance of, of putting up her best effort and watching that race, the way that he, I mean, there's no question. He, he took a strong hold of her and that's why the first quarter was slow. You had no chance, zero chance of winning with that strategy in my opinion, but thanks for the discussion. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole thing is like for the betters to not feel like they were given no chance. And I think that I, I feel that way a lot of times when I when I bet certain horses and they're ridden like that and they're taken out of their game a lot of times by the jockey, you know, unilaterally. I think that, you know, you kind of feel screwed. You kind of feel feel robbed a little bit. And I just I don't think that's something that we can afford to have people feeling the, the few remaining betters that we do have. I think, you know, it's it's. I don't know how you address it, but I think it's something that has to be addressed eventually that jockeys need to be riding more aggressively and there needs to be more accountability for that kind of thing. No, I want to make one more point and people have addressed this, but I I don't think I can say it enough. Let's suppose the situation was switched and uh, Gamin got, uh, excuse me, Venetian Harbor got the lead and Gamin took off of her and the pace was not, you know, slow, but not relatively that fast. Gamine is still going to win. I, I mean, p- people who say, well, I, you know, I got screwed. Well, Venetian Harbor, if she was good enough, would have won the race. Joel Rosario did not cost her that race. What cost her the race is she got beat by a better horse. So, you know, in the long run, was it a perfect ride? Was it not a perfect ride? I, I don't think anybody got screwed here. You know, Alan, you, you took a shot uh, in your, and I know this isn't why you brought this up, but in your, your double, you bet on the wrong horse. Um, you bet on the inferior horse. You know that now. You're a big boy. You were, and you know you're not going to uh, scream and cry about it. But I don't think you know people should. I just think it's worth mentioning one more time, at the very least, that you know, again, was there a horse alive, literally, uh, maybe with the exception of Tis the Law, that would have won that race over Gamine? I, I don't think there was. I, it's it's definitely true, and I that's why I said at the at the open that it's this did not affect the the decision of the race i just think um in general like extrapolating it to, to other races i think um people do have legitimate gripes when jockeys aren't ridden aggressively but yeah in this case definitely was it, it didn't matter you know the best horse won the race so we're, we're in agreement there the green group guest of the week is sponsored by the green group an accounting tax consulting and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry with over 500 clients in the horse business they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. Our Green Group Guest of the Week this week is a returning champion to the show, uh, Jack Knowlton of Sacatoga Stable. Obviously still flying high. Thanks for joining us, Jack. Glad to be here. All right. So good to have you. Um, this was an interesting performance for me for Tizalog because we obviously knew he was a really talented horse. He had had a lot of really impressive wins. But I thought this was kind of a breakout performance for him. He got a 109 buyer, which was easily his career best, and was kind of geared down as well. The thing I wonder is, this is a performance of his after being able to develop all spring and summer. And now you might even have a better horse going into the Derby in September than you would have in May. What have you seen in his development? And do you think that you're in a better position now with the rescheduled Derby than you would have been with the traditional Derby? 
<laughs> well, you know, we planned uh, his whole schedule around the first Saturday in May. And I think the way we won uh, Florida Derby, that uh, five weeks later, I think you would have seen a performance very close to what you just saw in Travers. Barkley and I have always felt very strongly that he is absolutely a mile and a quarter horse, that he would thrive. You look at his breeding, you know, you look at his, you know, performance, uh, particularly in the Florida Derby. I mean, he certainly appeared to be a horse that would have no problem with the distance. Now we have the luxury, uh, which has never really happened before, to have a mile and a quarter prep going into the Kentucky Derby. It's been answered. Can he get the distance? Yeah, we know that. There's really nobody else. You know, maybe the second place finisher in the Travers would say, yeah, he can, he can get the distance. But nobody else has proven it. And, uh, you know, as you all know, that is a big step. I mean, that extra eighth of a mile. And as you said, geared down. So, uh, you know, what could he have run, you know, in a different situation had the pace been a little faster, had Manny felt the need to use him more. But thankfully, uh, Manny's gotten to be a pretty savvy jockey on him. He knows what he's got under him. And I just love the fact where, you know, it looked like he was ready to, to give him a little pop and he looked back and there was nobody there. So he just, you know, put the crap away and that was it. Hey, Jack, Bill Finley, and thanks for joining us. So this is your second time through this, as we all know. In 2003 with Funny Side, you go through the traditional Triple Crown where the hard part is you got to squeeze three races in in five weeks. Now you go through this bizarro world triple crown where the races are spread out. They go from the Belmont in June all the way to October with the Freakness. Which one is harder and why? Well, I think, uh, you know, the training job that Barkley's done, having this horse sharp, you know, from the end of January to, you know, early August is phenomenal. And to be able to, to do that, particularly in the spring after the Florida Derby, we didn't know when the next race was going to be. We didn't know where it was going to be. We didn't know what it was going to be. And the fact that, uh, you know, Barkley kept him in training and, you know, did what he had to do to have him ready off. It was an 11 or 12 week layoff going into the Belmont. That to me is a tremendous training feat. You know, how we get the opportunity, you know, to, to really have a, an easier road with four weeks between the next two races. Uh, and that, uh, you know, I think is, is going to be, in a, that sense, easier than the five-week gauntlet that you have to run through in a traditional derby. But uh, I just think, you know, the, the training job that he's done to have him in a position that he's in now, I mean, Barkley's not one bit concerned about four weeks, four weeks. So, uh, you know, he came out of the race great. I was over there this morning, and uh, he certainly looks like a fresh horse. Jack, obviously, it's always every owner's dream to have a horse like Funny Side or Tis the Law, and you've been blessed with having two of those. Um, it's a little different road because of 2020 and because of the scheduling that we talked about, but it's also been a little different for you because you were able to sell the breeding rights to Tis the Law um, and you did it right after the Belmont. Can you walk us through some of the negotiations, um, not giving out numbers, of course, but just some of the interesting, um, you know, offers that were coming through from some of the various farms in Kentucky? Well, I mean, we, we really uh, did it. It wasn't after the Belmont. It, it, it ended up being announced after the Belmont, but uh, it, it actually happened after the Holy Bull. I mean, that, uh, that was a performance that, uh, I think caught uh, all the breeders' attention where, you know, Manny uh, kind of stopped him and pulled him out and started him. He got a big number, you know, under buyer figure in that race. And I guess, you know, I don't really look a lot at some of the other, uh, you know, like the rag sheets and stuff. But the, the phone calls started coming in after that race. I mean, there'd been a couple of inquiries, you know, prior to that, but, uh, you know, it was, it really got serious after the Holy Bowl and we had a lot of interest. Um, and I, I said two things to, you know, anybody that wanted to, to talk about it. And I said, number one, you know, no racing rights are, are going to be available. Number two, he has to be able to run through the end of his four-year-old year, as long as he's sound and healthy and, you know, 
running the, the way that he's been running. So, uh, you know, that really was what, uh, you know, it came down to and it ended up there were just a couple of, uh, you know, organizations that uh, really stepped up and uh, were competitive with each other. And as you know, we ended up going with, uh, with Coolmore and he'll stand at Ashford. Hey, uh, Jack, congratulations and uh, really appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Um, there are some parallels between Tis the Law and, and Funny Side. Funny Side was from the first crop of distorted humor, uh, full of 2000. And now you've got this first crop full from by Constitution, uh, both Windstar Stallions, by the way. And uh, just curious, so you gave 110000 for him at the Facing Tipton New York Red Sale. What was it that stood out to him, to you and your team, uh, when going through that yearling selection process? Well, I think, you know, the way we do things, Barkley, Robin, and I independently go through the catalog. And, and usually, you know, we, we kind of uh, play it like, uh, you know, everybody says the NFL draft, best available athlete. But we happen to have, you know, a couple of fillies uh, in the barn at that point. So you know, I said to Barkley, let's just, you know, look for Colt. So automatically we, we ended up eliminating half of the catalog. But, uh, you know, we, we liked, uh, you know, the fact that Constitution, you know, won a couple of grade one races, the son of Tappet, and uh, we really liked the dam. I mean, she was a grade two winner, you know, out of Tis now. And he obviously was, uh, you know, twice he won the Breeders' Cup Classic. And uh, so that was what we liked on the, on the page. Barkley didn't like to buy anything that on the dam side doesn't have black type in the first two generations. So then, you know, Barkley and Robin physically, you know, they do the examinations of the horse, what they like, what they don't like. And, uh, and then Barkley uh, has some pretty tough uh, vets that, uh, you know, do the vet work to, you know, give the final approval and uh, he pass all those tests. And uh, then, you know, we typically, as you know, we don't spend a lot of money on, on horses, one of the reasons that historically we've been, you know, really favoring New York breads. And we were looking at, at around a hundred thousand and uh, thankfully, uh, you know, we made that bid at 110 and got them. I wanted to ask you about Saratoga. When we talked to you last time, it was after the Florida Derby and you were remarking about how strange it was not to be there and just have to watch the race at home and celebrate remotely. This Saturday, you were able to be there. You were able to walk the horse into the winner's circle. Can you talk about how special that was for you and your partners to be able to actually experience something like that in person again? Oh, it was uh, it was tremendous. And as I say, we uh, were thankful that, uh, you know, the state and Naira were able to, uh, to make that happen. And, uh, you know, it's it's frustrating. I mean, I've lived in this town for, you know, 34 years and to to have a summer with a racetrack and racetrack running, not being able to be there, not having fans, is really tough. But uh, we were blessed to be able to be there to see, you know, I think one of the best performances ever in Travers. And I've been going to Travers since, you know, back in the 70s. I missed one in 1981 and uh, all the others I've been to, seen some great ones, saw uh, Arrogate, which uh, obviously I think is the, Time. But, uh, you know, this one is pretty close. You know, my big regret was that, uh, you know, we didn't have 50,000 people there and uh, having a hometown horse to accomplish what he did with a crowd that would have been just <clears throat> going absolutely crazy. But, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, you know, partners were there. I was able to be there. And uh, I think, you know, everybody who watched on Fox uh, got to see a performance that they won't soon forget. Hey, Jack, you talked about uh, selling the breeding rights, and it's interesting to say that you insisted the horse had to run at four, which really, well, the horse of this caliber and what he's achieved really doesn't happen anymore. I, I, can't, I can't think of the last horse that had this kind of three-year-old season was coming back at four. So a uh, two-part question, was that a tough sell to the farms? And so to the second part, why was that so important to you guys that he raced next year? Well, number one, it, it, it probably... If everybody know, know what they know now about him, it probably would have been a tougher sell. But uh, I mean, I basically, uh, you know, was adamant. Uh, look, our partners, only one other partner, Lou Titterton, 
went through the funny side uh, experience with me. I've got 33 partners. It just is, you know, for them is probably the best that it's ever going to be. And I didn't want it to, to have to end because, you know, winning big races, the three-year-old, and obviously he's been doing that, but uh, there's still, you know, some mountains to climb as a four-year-old. And I wanted to do it for the game, quite honestly. Uh, as you said, you know, an awful lot of the top horses, you see them as a three-year-old and not even their whole three-year-old year, and they're gone. And that's not good for the game. So I think, you know, those are all factors that I considered. And, uh, you know, quite honestly, you know, the only real pushback was, you know, you know, we don't want to do something when he's a four-year-old that's going to, you know, not reflect, hopefully then, you know, the success he has as a three-year-old. And we agreed that, uh, you know, if it came to, to be a question about whether he should continue to run, we'd, we'd talk about it. But hopefully that's not a topic that will come up because he'll continue doing what he's doing now. Uh, yeah, Jack, uh, the decision to, to, um, to ride Manny Franco on this horse to begin with and going forward now, uh, I'm sure you had some of the bigger jockeys knocking down your door early in, during his career last year. But can you just talk about how Manny fits this horse particularly in, uh, and about his development as a jockey on this circuit? Well, I think you know the, the story how, uh, how Manny got on. Uh, you know, Junior Alvarado had worked him last summer. He rode him in his maiden race at Saratoga. And he had came out of that race with a little shin, and, you know, so we couldn't run in a hopeful. And Barkley and I, you know, kept going back and forth. We, you know, follow the route. We went with Funny Side, and you know, try to win the Bond Guard, and then uh, Sleepy Hollow, or do we, you know, jump in the deep end of the pool and uh, and go to the Champagne. And it, it took us a while. And in the meantime, uh, you know, Junior had uh, committed to uh, Green Light Go, who had won, you know, Grade Two at Saratoga. So you know, we needed to, to have a jockey, and and Barkley really was. Uh, was the one that said, you know, I think that uh, that Manny is an up and coming jockey. He's kind of a jock that, you know, he's not going to spin you or Angel's not going to spin you if another opportunity comes that they'll stick with you. And, uh, you know, Manny's had a lot of success, but, uh, you know, he hasn't had the big horse like that. He has matured uh, tremendously. Uh, you know, the horse broke a little slowly and, uh, Churchill and got stuck down inside and his only loss. But after that, uh, I think Manny has just, you know, ridden him perfectly. We've been fortunate. We've gotten good posts. He's been able to put him where he wants to. The horse helps him a lot. And he has an awful lot of confidence in the horse that he can do what he needs to do when he needs to do it. I have one more question for you. I remember after Funny Side and all that success, I kind of expected you guys to really blow up and buy hundreds of horses and, and you know, really be the the kind of a nationally um, prominent owner. This time around, you have that breeding deal. Uh, you guys have stuck to the program so far, mostly New York breads, sticking with Barkley Tag. Uh, do you guys ever think you'll expand your program now if it's the success of Tizzle I mean, the only thing, uh, you know, we bought, uh, you know, three two-year-olds in training, uh, two Lao bands, uh, Colt and Philly, and uh, we bought a, a tonalist filly that we stepped out and went above our, our budget by far. We, we paid 290,000 for her at uh, the Fazig Tipton mid Atlantic sale. But, uh, you know, as you can imagine, uh, I've had an awful lot of people that uh, want to become part of Sacatoga with uh, the success of Tez. And, uh, you know, I can't, we're not going to get out of the New York bread program. We're not going to go away from Barclay tag. You know, I would say at a maximum, a maximum, we might, uh, you know, end up with, with 10 horses, but uh, certainly no more than that. Uh, you know, I think we can, you know, achieve uh, our goals. We don't have to have a lot of horses and uh, I'm not looking to, you know, run a big operation and Barkley isn't either. I mean, he wants to be selective and uh, we'll hopefully continue to find good New York breads. We Again, uh, you know, this year went with, uh, you know, a, a new sire, first crop sire, a wild band. And we also have a, a Spitzer three-year-old that got hurt in a 
stall accident down in uh, in Florida, but uh, he just came up to, to Saratoga. He was at Fair Hill, and Spicer seems to be doing pretty well. So uh, we'll stay with that program to some extent also. Yeah, I was going to ask if you had any New York bred two-year-olds that I could put a future bet on for next year's Derby. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, one of them might be running up here uh, before the end of the meet or right at the beginning of, uh, of Belmont. So uh, keep your eye out. Gotcha. Will yeah, which, which ended up naming the toneless filly because we were actually the underbidder on on her. She was, if I remember correctly, she was early in the sale and, and uh, Kip Elser was selling her, right? Yeah. Yeah, Tapple, T A P P L E Cider. Tapple Cider. Very Tapple good. Cider. Very yep. good. I, I, I wish you luck. Yeah, that was well, a thank you. Challenge. Jack, thank you so much for joining us. And also, thank you for running him. You guys could have put him in bubble wrap after the Belmont, but we wouldn't have gotten that performance on Saturday, which was really special. Best of luck in the Derby and the rest of the year. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, thank Jack. Jack. Thank you. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As The Green Group Guest of the Week, Jack Knowlton will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust The Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit The Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. So that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. Reminder to check out that Keeneland September catalog. Just came out yesterday. Check out the over 4,000 yearlings that will be on offer as well as Keeneland's enhanced bidding options that will be available so that even if you can't attend in person, it'll still be like you're there in the sales pavilion. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, Alan Carrasso, our Green Group guests of the week, Jack Knowlton, our producer, Patty Wolf, our editors, Anthony LaRocca and Danny Seiper, and our production coordinator, Michelle Sabrino. Thanks for watching. Wear a mask. We'll see you next week for our 50th show on The Writer's Room. Right.